We're now going to look at uh, reactions that uh, have gas as either a reaction or a product. Uh, the stoichiometry of such reactions. We'll come back and look at these reactions in terms of the energy uh, later on. Uh, but right now we're going to look at uh, reactions that either consume or produce a gas. Uh, in terms of quantities, calculating quantities of reactants or products. So the only difference, of course, is going to be on how we calculate a quantity of a gas. Uh, most often we're going to be using the ideal gas law to uh, calculate uh, moles of a gas or using moles to calculate uh, pressure or volume. So this example here, uh, we have um, decomposition of sodium azide, NaA3. Um, this is how we create the nitrogen gas to fill our airbags and our auto cars. This decomposition is an extremely fast reaction. And um, so if we want to know, if we know the volume of the bag that we want to fill, uh, so 78 liters at uh, 290 Kelvin, uh, 0.93 atmospheres, we know the volume of gas that we want to produce, how much sodium azide that we're going to use uh, in the process for this reaction. So we know the gas, so we're going to start off using the ideal gas law to calculate moles of the nitrogen gas. So we have our pressure, our volume, our temperature, we put it into the ideal gas law, and we get moles of nitrogen gas, in this case 3.1354 moles of nitrogen gas. Um, too many significant digits, that should be uh, 3.14 moles of nitrogen gas. And then once we have moles of nitrogen gas, we're going to do the stoichiometry of the reaction just the way that we normally would do it. So we're going to take the uh, stoichiometric ratio from the balance equation, uh, the two moles of sodium azide, what we're looking for on top over the three moles of nitrogen gas, what we're starting off with on bottom. We multiply that through, we'll get the moles of sodium azide. We're looking for mass, we multiply by the mass of sodium azide. Uh, the molar mass of sodium azide, and that will give us the mass of sodium azide, 136 grams of sodium azide. See, I said uh, we'll most likely be using the ideal gas law. We have the option that we can use uh, molar volume at STP if we're dealing with a gas at STP. That's the 22.41 liters per mole uh, at standard temperature and pressure. The nice thing about um, doing gases is that uh, if we're dealing with a, a bunch of gases all uh, at the same temperature and pressure, so that would be a one pot uh, container, one container, all the gases in there are all the same pressure, they're all at the same temperature. Uh, what we can do then, since um, at constant pressure, volume is before proportional to moles, we can use volume as if they are moles. So we can use liters as if we were dealing with moles. So if we're doing the reaction of nitrogen with hydrogen to produce ammonia, we react 15 liters of hydrogen uh, with excess nitrogen. How much uh, ammonia can we produce? What volume of ammonia can we produce? Uh, so they're all at the same pressure of 9 atmospheres, the same temperature, 800 Kelvin. Uh, so we can just use our liters of hydrogen as if they're moles. So we're taking our liters of hydrogen, 15 liters of hydrogen, multiplied by the stoichiometric ratio, 2 moles of ammonia over 3 moles of hydrogen, and that will give us 10 liters of ammonia as our product. So we can look at the um, molar mass of a gas. Uh, we can actually drive it into the ideal gas law if we want. Uh, we can drive the density of gas into the ideal gas law also. Um, we can get molar mass in by drive, getting the equation the moles is mass divided by molar mass. Uh, so once we get this, mass divided by molar mass is equals moles. We put that in for moles into the ideal gas law. Um, and then once we have it in there, we can move it around a little bit. Uh, one of the combinations here is 
combining mass with volume. So we get mass with volume. Well, mass with volume is density. So we replace that with a D for density. Um, so we move the molar mass across, and we get the pressure times molar mass equals density times the gas constant times Kelvin temperature. Uh, so we can rearrange the ideal gas law to give us the relationship of molar mass in there. So we can look at the effect of molar mass on uh, the gases. So if we um, look at a gas at 273 Kelvin at one atmosphere, it has a density of 1.34 grams per liter. What's the molar mass? Uh, so we can take the equation, solve for molar mass, and so molar mass would be density times gas constant times temperature divided by pressure. So that's all that we have to do is put everything in, making sure the units are canceling properly. After we cancel all the units, we end up with 30 grams per mole, run the numbers through our calculator, and we end up with 30.0 grams per mole. So we can, instead of having to uh, memorize an equation with molar mass in it, we can also get molar mass from a gas uh, just using the ideal gas law. Knowing that uh, molar mass is mass divided by moles, uh, we'll need to know the mass of a gas, um, but then we just use the ideal gas law to solve for moles. Then we take the mass divided by moles, and that gives us our molar mass. So we have a gas here. We know it has a mass of one gram. We got volume, temperature, and pressure. We want to know the molar mass. So we're just going to use the ideal gas law, solve for moles of the gas. Once we have moles of the gas, we do the, ma the mass divided by moles, and we'll end up with the molar mass of 89.6 grams per mole. A lot of the gases that we look at, such as air, is mixtures. So if we look at the mixture, uh, we have several different gases present. Uh, there's a pressure of the whole gas. We ideal gas law can talk about the whole gas. Uh, but the individual gases present, uh, what's their effect on the pressure? Uh, Dalton proposed, and it was uh, proven true, that, that the we can identify a or assign a individual pressure to each of the gases. That is called the partial pressure of the gas. And the total pressure of the gas mixture is the sum of the individual partial pressures of each gas present. And we can relate the partial pressure of gas to the total pressure of gas. We, use, we do this using mole fraction. So a mole fraction, mole fraction is we represent mole fraction with the Greek letter chi. Uh, looks like a, a large fancy X. Uh, we're going to use the um, moles of the component over the total moles of the mixture. Uh, that's the mole fraction. So mole fraction of a gas will allow us to relate the total pressure of gas to the partial pressure of an individual gas. Uh, so the partial pressure of gas is going to be uh, the total pressure times the mole fraction of that gas. So this uh, mole fraction allows us to relate total pressure to the partial pressure of a gas in a mixture. If we uh, collect gas over water, collecting gas over water, what that normally means is that we, um, if we're making a gas, we need to separate it from air. Uh, one simple way to do it is just use water as a water seal. We use that uh, frequently. Uh, if you look under a sink, you'll see this um, U-shape under the sink. That's full of water uh, to prevent the gases in the drain from coming into the kitchen. Um, so if we use water as a seal to separate uh, our gas from air, then that gas will have a certain amount of water vapor in it. Uh, so it'll be a wet gas. 
Well, when we measure pressure, we're measuring the total pressure, including the partial pressure of water. Uh, the nice thing about it is that uh, we have tables of the partial pressure of water based on its temperature. So we can just go look up, measure the temperature of the water, look it up the partial pressure at that temperature, subtract that off the total pressure, and that will give us the pressure of the gas that we have made. So then we can calculate the amount of gas that we have made. Gases, ideal gases, uh, we describe using the kinetic molecular theory of gases. Um, and this theory describes ideal gases perfectly and uh, it um, doesn't, there's a couple discrepancies with real gases, gases that uh, uh, deviate from the ideal gas law. So the kinetic molecular theory states that gases are made up of very tiny molecules compared to the distance between them. Really that statement was gases are made up of point particles, um, treating gases, gas molecules as having no volume. And uh, this is because the math of dealing with a point particle is real easy. The math of a volume is more challenging. Um, and under you no know, high pressure conditions where gases are compressed together, it, the volume of the gas really shows up and then it changes the results. That's where we deviate from the ideal gas law. Gas molecules are in constant motion. Um, they just move. They're going to move in a straight line until they hit something. Then they bounce off uh, and they're just moving in random directions. So they're always moving hit something, bounce off, move, hit something, bounce off, move, and continually that way. Uh, gas molecules exert no force on each other, no attractive repulsive force on each other. Uh, and for normal conditions, this works. Uh, this is why uh, uh, normal gases obey the ideal gas law. Um, so the gas molecules are moving sufficiently fast and they're sufficiently far apart from each other that they do not feel any effect. If they felt an effect then they would curve, they would move in curved lines not straight lines. Um, but uh, they generally are not feeling each other so they're moving in straight lines. Uh, where this one fails uh, on two conditions uh, if we again raise the pressure high enough now we're pushing the molecules together so they're near each other on a more consistent basis. They will start to feel each other's effects on each other. And the other one also is at low temperature where the molecules are moving slowly. So when they're moving slowly now they can have a chance to feel the presence of the adjacent molecule and start to curve around in the process. Um, but for ideal gases um, they just move in straight lines and they do not feel each other until they hit each other, until they have a collision. And um, gas molecules have elastic collisions. Um, all collisions have conservation of moment momentum. Elastic collisions also has conservation of energy. Well, everything has conservation of energy, but we see it in different ways. Um, so in the motion of the molecules itself, elastic collisions will have conservation of energy. All collisions will have conservation momentum. So by having uh, elastic collisions what it's saying is that uh, no energy is put into the molecules. They just bounce off of each other. Uh, they don't break any bonds. They don't deform the molecule. So because no energy goes into the molecules why it's uh, conservation of energy for the motion of the molecules. And the final part is that the average kinetic energy of the molecules is proportional to Kelvin temperature. So as we increase temperature, we're even increasing the average kinetic energy of the molecules. As we decrease temperature, we're decreasing the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So a gas mixture, a gas mixture, all the components of the gas mixture, all the different gas components, are going to have the same temperature. Now the molecules. Uh, we're going to have a range of temperatures. Uh, the molecule is going to have a range of kinetic energies. 
Some will be moving slow, some will be moving fast. But we look at the average and we'll find that they're, they have a constant average. So for gas mixture like air where we have nitrogen and oxygen, the average uh, energy is going to be the same of nitrogen and oxygen and the temperature will be the same of nitrogen and oxygen. So for gas mixtures, uh, all the gases in the mixture have the same temperature. They all have the same average kinetic energy. So we can describe uh, the laws of uh, gases using kinetic molecular theory also. So if we look at uh, Boyle's law, pressure versus volume, uh, we know that uh, this is an inverse law. So as volume decreases, pressure increases. As volume decreases, uh, there's going to be less space between the molecules. So there's going to be more collisions. There'll be more collisions between the molecules, more collisions between the molecules and the walls. Uh, the increase in the number of collisions is going to increase the pressure of the gas. Looking at the Gay-Lussac's law, uh, pressure versus temperature, um, this is a direct relationship. So as we increase temperature, we increase pressure. So as we increase temperature, uh, the molecules get the higher average kinetic energy. So they have higher energy, they're moving faster. Uh, so when they hit the wall, they exert more force on the wall, increasing the pressure of the gas. If we look at Charles' law, volume versus temperature, we also know, know that this is a direct relationship. As we increase temperature, the volume increases. As we increase temperature, again, the average kinetic energy increases, the speed increases. Uh, the uh, molecules exert more force on the walls. However, in this case, the walls are flexible. Um, and by design, uh, the inside pressure and outside pressure have to be constant. So the increase in the energy of the molecules will increase the pressure. But since the walls are flexible, as the molecules are colliding on them instead of, instead of just increasing pressure it's now pushing the walls increasing the volume as we increase the volume the space between the molecules would decrease so we're decreasing the frequency of collisions so the pressure becomes remains constant as a balance between the increased energy of collision and the decreased frequency of collision uh, for Avogadro's law, we know that volume will increase as we increase moles. Again, we're dealing with a flexible container. This is a direct relationship. So we, as we add more moles in, we're increasing the frequency of collision. And um, since the walls can move, they will move, expand um, until, uh, and as they expand the volume, the frequency of collision decreases until we have balanced off uh, they increase the moles with the increase of volume so that now the frequency of collision per unit area is identical. And for Dalton's law, uh, the uh, molecules are, are independent of each other. Uh, they have um, uh, the same average kinetic energy. They'll have the same frequency of collisions. Um, and we could determine the individual pressures of the components of the gas and uh, it just equals the total pressure. The sum of these equals the total pressure. So there's nothing in the identity of the gas here that will affect uh, the pressure uh, of the overall gas.